Well, it's good to be here. I, I praise God for the privilege, you know, it is a privilege to come up and share the gospel. Uh, it is probably the coldest day of the year right now. Last year at this time, I was in New Zealand on a mission trip, and their, their summers are opposite of our winters. So ah, it was like 75, and I was on the beach. Praise God. And I'd rather be there than here, no offense or anything, at least right now in this cold, what is it, like five below wind chill or something? What's it? Nine degrees. And what's the wind chill? Ooh, I don't know. But basically what I'm going to be speaking on is, a, is fig leaves won't do. Calvin helped me make this slide, is that cool? Fig leaves won't do, Adam and Eve. Now, the reason I'm talking about this, I'm going to give my testimony today, is that something happened to me when I was reading the book of Mark not too long ago. And I saw that Jesus came to a fig tree and there was no fruit on it, and he got upset and cursed the fig tree. Now, Jesus doesn't go around cursing things, does he? It made me wonder why would he curse a fig tree? And the Bible says there was no fruit on it. After he cursed it, he went to the temple and he cleansed the temple. And I know there's a lot of theology about this because when he came back, the fig tree was withered. And a lot of theologians, I studied it out, different commentaries, they believe that it had something to do with Israel, and it does. Something to do with uh, making the temple a den of thieves, and it does. But there's something more, something deeper. There's something that goes even farther back than Israel. And I'm, we're going to talk about that right now. Would you open your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 2. We're going to start at verse 8. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground, the Lord God made every tree to grow. Whoops, I'm sorry, let me click that. There we go. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground, the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, right in the center, there's two trees. It's not just one, two. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend it and to keep it. Uh, how many like gardening? You don't like gardening? Well, you know what? That was the job of humanity, to take care of this planet, right? To tend it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the middle or in the midst of the garden, God has said you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. God said you will surely die. The serpent is saying the opposite. He's a liar. You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard your voice in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Let's go down to verse 21 of chapter 3. 
Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skins and clothed them. He took away the fig leaves. God was the very first in the whole entire Bible to to sacrifice an innocent animal to clothe humanity. Fig leaves won't do. It's going to take innocent blood. It's going to take innocent blood. Fig leaves won't do. And then he was banished. Listen to verse 34. Genesis 3, so he drove out the man and he placed cherubim at the east of the garden in a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the tree of life. They hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. I was afraid and I was naked and hid myself. The very first time humanity ever felt fear was right here. The first time fear entered the human race was right here. I was afraid and hid myself. And I'm here to tell you today, we're going to talk about faith and we're going to talk about fear. Fear is the opposite. Doubt and fear are the opposite of faith. And so, would you let me share with you my testimony? Because that's why I'm here. I mean, I want to talk about how I hid myself. You know, think about it. Adam and Eve sinned and they sowed. Think about it. They sowed. They, they made their own efforts. I don't know how many people are a seamstress here, but Adam and Eve were the first ones to sew garments. They knew they were naked. They sewed. They took leaves, stitched them together, and the Bible says called them loincloths. They weren't very big. Clothes, loincloths, but they covered their nakedness. They knew they were naked. They were afraid and hid themselves. Now, let me tell you something. Humanity still conceals itself Today, when you look at all around, I don't care who it is, look at, read the news, just watch, read the newspapers, look at the news, they're still sewing, folks. We're trying to hide our shame. And, and today, we don't even have much shame anymore. We explain things away. We say, oh, it's okay to do this now, and it's okay to do that. So there's very little shame. But let me tell you something. There's great shame, even in the, those who claim there's no shame. They're living, in, they're living in it constantly, constantly afraid. And after Adam and Eve sinned, God challenged them, and they passed the buck. Do you remember uh, Adam said to the Lord, when the Lord asked, what's going on, why did you do this? Adam said, the woman you gave me. Think about that. The, the accusation on the word you. It was the woman that you gave me. She gave me to eat, and you gave me this woman. You know that, Lord. Think about that. And the woman basically said the same thing. She goes, it's the serpent. How many, how many understand passing the buck is very profound and very powerful? And we still do it today, don't we? And then the curses and judgments and the consequences came. The Lord said to the serpent, on your belly you shall go. You will bruise the man's heel and he will bruise your head. That was a prophetic utterance about the Messiah who was going to come and destroy Satan. The woman, you're going, to be, you're, you're going to multiply sorrow in childbirth and your husband's going to rule over you. And then the man, cursed is the ground and you will toil and thorns will come out. Dust, you are going to return to dust to dust, death. So in the day you eat thereof, you will what? Surely die. A thousand years is like unto one day, and a day like a thousand years to the Lord. In the day, no no one has ever lived a thousand years until Jesus rose from the dead. Think about that. The day that you eat of, you shall surely die. So let me give you my testimony. Uh, At three years old, uh, my dad left my mom and my brother and I. Abandoned us. Now, for some reason, you know, I'll tell you what, I remember the first memory I ever had was a disappointment. I remember having an ice cream cone, huge ice cream cone, big ice cream cone. And I'm walking down the street with my brother, and it just, all of a sudden, the top fell off. It just fell off, boom. I remember, that was my first memory. My second memory was that my dad took my brother and I to the bus stop to say goodbye and got on a bus. Gone. He left us. And let me tell you something that crushed me, even at that little young age, three years old. But I had a great mother, a great single mom. How many many single moms in here? 
How many had a single mom? How many know single moms? Let me tell you something. They're here. She's my hero. She's my heroine. She's gone to be with Jesus now, but she is still my heroine. She's my hero. I had great friends, and we lived in Detroit, and we were very poor, but you know what? We didn't care. My brother and I and our friends, we were just so happy. Yes, we didn't have a dad, and yes, we were a little embarrassed about that, but we had each other, and we had friends. How many, I don't know if you guys go out to play anymore very much. In Detroit, we used to go out and play all the time on the streets. But now my mom, she would iron clothes to feed us. She'd work really hard, and one day, she got... An amazing job working for Wayne County in Michigan at the morgue in Detroit. It was a very busy place. She was a, <laughs> she was a phonotypist. Doctors would do uh, autopsies and speak into tape recorders with all this lingo. And my mother got trained as a typist. She got trained to understand all that lingo. And she would listen to their surgical outcomes and type all day long reports and when I was and, and she got this job after a few years she saved up her pennies I was 12 years old you know what she got she saved up her pen a single mom and she bought me a piano 12 years old from the Grinnell brothers I'll never forget it it's powerful and I still play today by the way I love it now she could not afford lessons because she was making payments so I had to learn by ear. And pounding with your ear is really difficult. <laughs> but no, really, truly, I had to learn, and my brother was like, man, would you stop that? My mom's, come on, I love that, that's beautiful. And it wasn't beautiful. <laughs> but it got better and better and better. So I turned out to be a musician, and my brother <laughs> played guitar, and we loved rock and roll. We became musicians. And as a teen, we started a, a band. We weren't really famous, but we had a good time. And we were in Detroit, and we had a couple hundred fans, and we had, we had parties, and we were rock and rollers. And let me tell you something. There's something about a gang that brings significance and security. How many need significance and security? There's something about a band, too, that brings significance and security. Close friends, music. But the enemy came in. But let me tell you something about the Beatles and about the music. The Beatles are great musicians, and especially early on with all their little love songs, but let me tell you something. They led us into drugs when they went into drugs. The Pied Piper, you know what I mean? And so sex, drugs, and rock and roll was what it was all about. And then when I was 16, from 26, I call, from 16 years old until I was 26, I call it my decade of drugs, demons, and death. I was full of darkness, full of depression, and you know what? What happened is I was, we were very popular, and, and I had a lot of friends, but when you do drugs, let me warn you young people out there, anybody out there that messes with, you open yourself up to demonic powers, hell, suicide, depression. It's true. I'm not talking about pharmacies, and I'm not talking about medicine. I'm talking about illicit drugs. THC, LSD, cocaine, all those things, marijuana, alcohol, put them on and mix them all together. Oh, boy, we had fun. No. We did have fun. We thought it was fun, but it was ready. It was dark. It was dark and demonic. And so after a while, you talk about fear. I was afraid it hit myself. I began to withdraw from my friends. Where's Harry, Ian? That's my brother's name, Ian. Where's your brother? My brother was two years older than I. Oh, he just, he's not wanting to come out. Something's wrong. I don't know what it is, but, well, where is he? We, we miss him. I was hiding in my bedroom. I was hiding. I was afraid. I didn't like people. I didn't like friends. I didn't like anything. As a matter of fact, I hated my life to the point where I wanted out. You talk about Drugs and suicide and depression. I tell you what, I have scars from a razor blade when I was 18 years old. Young people stay away from drugs. Stay away from Ouija boards and witchcraft. I was into all that. Stay away from going to rock and roll bands and wait and worshiping Satan. Let me tell you something. We did that. And I got possessed. And when you're possessed, Nothing is good, not one good thing. So from 16 to 26, I spent 
How many times in rehab? How many times in counseling? How many times in... And so my testimony today is this, that fig leaves won't do. And when I finally met Jesus Christ, his innocent blood washed me from all that, delivered me from demons. And let me tell you something. There's no greater freedom than through the cross, through the blood, through the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. You understand that? Now, when my, at 18, I, I, I slit my wrist. It didn't work. I was even a failure at this. I, they scabbed over. And my mother, my poor precious mom, single mom, was working every day. She came home and saw that, and she goes, oh, I couldn't hide it. She saw it after a couple of days. I couldn't hide the scab. So she said, I'm getting you help. So she sends me to counseling. I'll never forget this. She sent me to a... I won't name the religion or anything, but she sent me to a pastor, uh, an educated man of the cloth. I sat there in his office, and all he could say to me is ask questions. What's wrong? What, what's going on? And he meant well, but he never preached the gospel to me. He never opened the word to me. He just wanted to figure out what was wrong so he could help me and, and, and comfort my mom. But let me tell you something. Good intentions will never cast out a devil. Good intentions, and I don't care how many degrees you have, you will not cast out a devil. So razor blades, counseling, hospitalizations, and rehab over and over again. How many times? Probably 10, 12. The worst time was August 1st, 1978. I was 18 at this point. No, actually, I was 24, I think, yeah, 24. And uh, I'll never forget, I got some, I went to the doctor and got sleeping pills called Placidil, barbiturates. All I wanted to do was kill myself, but razor blades didn't work, so I'm going to try something else. So I'll never forget, August 1st, 1978, I took these, these sleeping pills in my room, and I bought a bottle of whiskey. And I'm watching this movie called Fahrenheit 451 by Ray Bradbury. And it was all about, a, it was a terrible movie about how the government is burning books. And Fahrenheit 451 is the temperature that paper burns and how they were just controlling everybody. And I just wanted off the planet. And so what I did is I'll never forget, I took all handfuls and handfuls of, of, of Placidil sleeping pills. And I, ready, I, started, I drank all that whiskey. And I'm like... I had no idea what I was doing. I just wanted out because these tormenting spirits were inside of me. Do you understand? Fig leaves won't do. I wanted to hide. There's no place to hide. There's no place to hide when you're demonized. And do not mess with drugs, folks. So, I fall out under a coma. The next morning, my brother gets up. My mother has passed through cancer at this, by this point, so it's just me and him living there. My brother gets up to go to work. He goes out the door, he's down the stairs, and all of a sudden he hears the phone ring. He doesn't know whether he should get or not, he's late. But his fiance, my sweet sister-in-law Lenore, something made her call, and he turned around and he came back and he picked up the phone and said, what, I'm late. She said, go check on your brother. Go check on your brother, Harry. And he came into the bedroom, and there I was, choking on my own vomit. He rushed me to the hospital. I was in a coma for seven days. They thought I would be a vegetable. I meant business. I didn't want razor blades. I wanted out. I wanted off the planet. The doctors told me later, because I did wake up, you can tell. <laughs> <laughs> They told me later, you had so many visitors. You're so popular. Why would you take your life? They didn't understand. I was demonized. I don't care how many visitors you have. If you're demonized, you're not happy. I don't care how popular you are. If you're doing drugs and you're demonized, you don't want visitors. I want it off the planet. So my sister, Bernice... Seven days into this coma, they thought I'd be a vegetable if I woke up at all. She said, Harry, if you're there, wiggle your big toe. She's looking at my big toe, it wiggles. And she, she came up to me, and she realized she's going to slap me. 
she's literally going to slap the hell out of me. When I say slap the hell, I'm not swearing. I'm telling you, I was full of hell through the demons. And she started, she wound up and she started slapping me. I don't know how many times, maybe six, seven, eight, ten. I don't know. Bernice, you're going to have to tell me someday how many times it was. But I woke up after seven days. You know what I did? The very first thing I did? I cried. Because I was still on this terrible planet. I was still demons. Demonized. You can't slap a demon out. You can't medicate a demon out. You can't even commit suicide and demons will leave. I woke up. William Beaumont Hospital, 19... 78, April 7th, and, and then guess what they did? Put me through counseling, put me upstairs in the psych unit, gave me all these medications, more meds, wow, that's what I need, more medication. I'll tell you what, let me just explain to you this, this marvelous thing, this is one of the low, low points in my life after this, they're giving me these meds, and there's side effects to these weird psychotic, psych, psychotic meds. And one of them is called Tardinia dyskinesia, something like that, where you can't, you, you can't, you, you, your muscles start tightening up and you can't turn, you can't move. I'm sitting here under the doctor's care in a, in a psych unit with people, other people that are, that are needy there too. I don't know how many were demonized, maybe all of us were. We're on meds and all of a sudden I can't move. I can't breathe. <laughs> this, these meds that they give me, I can't even move my, my neck. And I, I'm, I'm like, I'm like a tr- I can't move. And I, I'm being tormented by demons. And let me tell you, that was the low point of my life. <laughs> Listen, doctors, and no offense, I love, I love you all. I, I know psych units, and I know all, there's a lot of good people out there. In, 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 but listen, you need more than medicine. The gospel of Jesus Christ delivered me. And let me tell you something. If you go into the ministry, preach the gospel, preach the blood, because Satan hates that and he will flee from that. To make a long story short, I ended up in a halfway house in Pontiac, Michigan. And I think they call it a halfway house because they feed you half the time. I had two meals a day for a couple years. And I'm starving. And by the way, I lived in a house with about Ten other men, and most of them were demonized. Some of them hung out in cemeteries. We were all on assistance. We were all on meds. And there was a couple people that worked there that they fed to, you know, they didn't even spend the night there. They just kind of came in and fed us and ran, (laughs) you know. And it was a terrible place. I can't even, I'm not even going to tell you the things that happened there, but let me put it this way. It was dark and demonic, and it was in a, not a very good part of town. Now you talk about the black sheep of the family, because my, my brother and my mother and all my friends loved me, and we lived in a, my mom bought a home, she bought me a piano, I mean, things were really good for a while, but, but I ended up is the, in the worst part of town, with demons and men full of demons, let me tell you something, don't do drugs, folks, big leaves won't do, so I heard about a coffee house Praise God for churches. A church put on a coffee house downtown Pontiac, Michigan, in a little small storefront church where you could go and eat cake, cake, and and sandwiches and all kinds of stuff. And by the way, I was demonized. I didn't want to go, but I was like, something will overcome a demon. It's your stomach. I'm starving. I want food. So what I did is, you know, ready? This is 40 years ago, folks. I'm now serving the Lord 40 years as the last week. 40 years. When I first came to the Lord, my friends, and they said, it's not going to last. Here it is, 40 years. Last week, I've been falling. I'm not leaving my God, my Jesus. 40 years. Hallelujah. It makes me, it, 
It makes me think, what have I been? Well, well, I wasted so many years of my life. I was 26 when I met Jesus. Now I'm 66. 40 years of loving Jesus is wonderful. But let me tell you this, what happened. So I'm, I I'm got my jacket on. I got my cold. I don't want to go out, but I'm starving. I, I walk like this. I'm, I'm freaked out with demons. I'm on medicine. And I'm walking down the streets of Pontiac, Michigan, wanting to go get a piece of cake. So I get to the door, and inside, and that's a small little storefront church, but I hear music, and I hear clapping, like they're having fun in there. And I wanted to go in so bad, but I was so afraid. I put my hand to the door, and I decided against it because I was too afraid. The demons, do you think the demons inside of me wanted me to go in a Pentecostal church? No way. So my, my hand went out to reach that door. I put my hand to it, and I said, no, i got to go. I'm too afraid. And something, I had angelic assistance. Something, gr- something forced my hand on that door, and it wasn't a devil. And opened it, and I opened it, and they all were looking at me. The pastor was over here, and they're all looking at me like, we got one. <laughs> and he's not, well, we got one. And he looks really, really rough and skinny and hungry and gruffy and demonized, but we got one. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God for Pentecostal churches. I didn't know what I was getting into. All I knew is I looked in the back and I saw cake. <laughs> I saw sandwiches. I saw Kool Aid. They couldn't even afford pop, but hey, I don't care. It's Kool Aid. And I'm walking back there. And as I'm walking back there, People are looking at me and they're singing and praising God. I, oh, I, want, I want cake. <laughs> Give me some cake. First thing I think I did was forget the sandwiches. I'm <laughs> eating cake. And the demons inside me hate it. They didn't mind the cake. They, did, they, they minded the, 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 the Pentecostal power that was there. But here's the, this man's name was Pastor Franklin Housley. Young man in his 20s and his wife and kids were there and he was playing the guitar and singing and he was worshiping Jesus and I'm eating cake and look, watching and, and, and you know what? I heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. He talked the very simple gospel of Jesus Christ. He talked about sin and he talked about Adam and Eve and he talked about the, 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 the wickedness of mankind and I was at the bottom. There's no way, I couldn't go any lower. I mean, I'm in a halfway house in a slum. I've lost everything. (laughs) What am I going to do? So I gave my life to Jesus Christ. That was January 31st, 1981. Saturday night. It was a Saturday night I'll never forget in my life. Now, the next morning they said, we have church on Sunday morning. Go home. They, They wouldn't have said go home if they knew where I was going in that halfway house. Go home and come back in the morning. Now, already Saturday night. Now, listen, I gave my life to Jesus. I'm on my way. I have cake. I I ate sandwiches. I'm full. And I'm smiling for the first time in how many years? The Holy Spirit began delivering me, but I wanted to go to church the next morning. So, ready? I'm going back to uh, this halfway house with ten demonized men. You talk about warfare all night long. Oh, my gosh. But that next morning, I got up, put my jacket on. I'm going to that church. Something happened last night. It wasn't just the cake. It wasn't just the sandwich. I felt something, something good. I felt joy. So I went there, heard the gospel, and then they told me about water baptism and, and they said to come and be buried in Jesus' name. And so ready in this little small storefront church in Pontiac, Michigan, February 1st, 1981, they had a horse trough in the back with ice cold water. <laughs> We're talking about February. And even though it was in a back room, this water was cold. There was no heat back there. But I didn't care. I, I finally, I'm getting rid of demons. So I, they put me in this, this horse trap, boom, in the name of Jesus. And I came up ice cold, but delivered. <laughs> Hallelujah. Fig leaves won't do. <laughs> Fig leaves won't do, folks. It's going to take innocent blood. And I, I was finally free. To make a long story short, 
I went there a couple months, and they told me it's about another baptism, the power of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, you have to understand, I was saved, I was water baptized, I was be, uh, my life was getting better, I was smiling, I wasn't full of fear, but they told me there's something else you need that Jesus promised. He said, he said to the disciples, before you go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, tarry until you be clothed from on high. Now, all these Pentecostals in my church, they love me so much, they're always laying hands on me, trying to, for me to get the Holy Ghost and speak in tongues. And I'm like, I'm already delivered. I, why do I need this? And then ready, I got confused. I had people begin to tell me it wasn't for today, that the gift of the Holy Spirit was just for the apostles. I had, a, I had some relatives who were Baptists. No offense or anything. They love the Lord. I hope they're saved. Amen. They love Jesus. But they said, no, it's not for today. You're, you're part of this weird stuff. Stay away from these people. But I'll tell you what, I love these people. They're good people. They push me down a little bit when, I'm, when they're praying for me. <laughs> come on, man. Come on. Harry, come here. I'm like, ah, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I've been water baptized. They keep your hands off me. To make a long story short, I decided to look into it myself. Don't be spoon-fed. So I went to the library, now still in a halfway house with demonized folk, but I'm much better. Matter of fact, they're all looking at me like, what happened to you? The staff are putting me in charge of things now. I'm breaking up fights. Hey, you want to work here? I mean, I'm really a lot better. But they told me, you need some power. You need to get plugged into the power. You got the whole, you, listen, you love Jesus. You're born again, but you need to get plugged into the electric power because you need more than that. And I did. Because when I was in the world, I needed LSD and THC and all these things because I like power. I like to feel that high. Well, there's something greater than that. That's all counterfeit. Do you know that? All those are counterfeits. I needed something real. So what I did is I went to the library and I got five translations and I put them on a 10-speed bike and I said, I'm going to go out to eat at a, at a restaurant tonight. I'm going to open up all these Bibles and study it out for myself. Now this restaurant's called the Ram's Horn Restaurant near Pontiac Silverdome in Michigan where the Lions used to play. The ram's horn. Do you know what a ram's horn is? It's a shofar. What a place. Well, when I got there, by the way, the, the restaurant's open 24 hours a day. Open all night long. And so, I got there. Started drinking coffee after my dinner. I had a good meal. Oh, my gosh. I'm better. <laughs> Food and coffee and the book of Acts. The book of Matthew, Mark. All the, you know, I noticed Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all start with John the Baptist saying, you know, Jesus is here, and, and he, I'm baptizing you with water, but he's going to come and baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Every gospel starts like that. And then the book of Acts, I, I started looking in the book of Acts at this restaurant, and I started looking at these translations, and I started realizing that Jesus said, you will receive power after the Holy Ghost comes upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me. Now, I was already a Christian, but I needed power to witness, right? To make a long story short, it started raining like Noah's flood. I couldn't leave. I don't want to mess up these Bibles. I mean, could you imagine five beautiful big Bibles from the library that I don't even own? I can't leave. They'll get wet. So all night long, can I have some more coffee, ma'am? More cake? What do you get? What else you got? All night long, I'm reading the Word. And then dawn, this is April 11th, 1981. This is a couple months after. I've got salvation a couple months after water baptism. It took me this, much, this long to study it out. Finally, something dawned on me at dawn. I got on, it stopped raining. A beautiful, beautiful sun started rising. And it was spring. And I got on my bike and I went home, went to this halfway house. I got off my bike with the translations. And I look at, the, look at, look, look at this house I'm going to go into. And I said, no, I'm not going in there. And I got in, this, in, in a, an abandoned car on the side of the house, an old station wagon, and I got in the back seat. And I'll never forget, the, the energy was charged, and my faith was so strong, and I needed power. 
Yes, I was already a clean vessel. I was already a Christian. I was already water baptized. But I was still shy. You know what I mean? I was still afraid. I was still timid. And so I, got, I, I saw this in the book of Acts, and I saw it in all these translations, and I realized it. G, Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost and said, Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises unto you and unto your children and even to all who are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. What promise? The promise of the Father, the promise of the Holy Spirit. So I wanted that. So finally, I'm in the side of the house in this car, and I realize now, the Father, no one's around me, no one's pushing me, no one's, no one's pressuring me, but I love you, Jesus. And I started worshiping him, and I started thanking him. Then all of a sudden, the lightnings of God hit me. I mean, I'm talking about the power of God hit me. I started speaking in this beautiful language I never learned. It starts pouring out one syllable at a time, and it looked, sounded like French and Arabic, and, and you know what? Tongues is powerful, but there's something much deeper going on in my heart. I got plugged in. There was lightnings of God hitting my soul. And let me tell you, fig leaves won't do. Fig leaves won't do. It's going to take innocent bloodshed for you. Did you know God was the first one to commit a, an animal sacrifice pointing to a bloody cross? You know, every single sacrifice from Genesis when God did it, all the way through Exodus and Leviticus, all the sacrifices, all the Passover lives, everything pointed to a bloody cross. And now finally, because of that cross, not only am I forgiven, I'm clothed with the righteousness of God. Coats of skins, tunics, not fig leaves, but, but not coats of skins either. The righteousness of Christ. And now because of the righteousness of Christ, I'm new, I'm changed, the fire of God hit me. Now let me tell you something. From that day forward, I was changed. This shy man could stand before hundreds of people and begin to preach the gospel with power and authority. But what happened to Peter when he denied the Lord three times before Maiden? What happened to him to stand before thousands? He received the power of the Pentecostal experience on the day of Pentecost. That same power hit me. So I call my brother. <laughs> I'm still at a halfway house. My, brother's, my brother never really got nearly, nearly as bad as I, I was. But I, I called him and I said, Ian, something happened to me. I speak in tongues and I'm on fire. He goes, you are? <laughs> I said, I want, all my, I want a party. I want to throw a party for all my friends so I can stand up and tell them all about Jesus. They, they think you're crazy, man. Wait a minute, you tried to kill yourself how many times? How many hospitals are you in? And now you want to come to my house and throw a party. Yes, put it, make some cake. So let me just say this to you before I close. About 20, 30 of my closest friends came. And I was able to stand up and proclaim the gospel. They still think I'm a little crazy, but now it's 40 years later. They call me once in a while and ask questions, and I've done a few funerals for their families. It's really cool. But let me just say this to you. 40 years of me going around telling people about Jesus. I have seven grandchildren now. I'm on fire for Jesus. I will not stop. I will not shut up. I, I try to tell everybody I can about Jesus. Don't tell me the Holy Spirit's not for today. It is for today. And some of you need that, right? Listen to this. Mark 11, 12 through 14. Now the next day, when they had come out from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree far, or a, 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 far, a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. When he came, this is Jesus, when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season of figs. In response, Jesus said to it, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. There's no fruit. There's no fruit when you work and hide your own shame. Jesus cursed the fig tree. Why? There was leaves. It had something to do with, I believe, three days after he cursed it and it was withered, he died on a cross to cover us with coats of skins of his righteousness. Amen? Fig leaves won't do. 
Look at verse 20. Mark 11. Now in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. So Jesus answered and said to them, what? Have what? Faith in God. What did Adam and Eve lose? I was afraid and hid myself, so I sewed fig leaves together. The opposite of faith is doubt. Satan, come to sell, Satan came to sow doubt in Eve and in Adam. Did God really say? Doubt. So they sowed fig leaves. I was afraid and hid myself. And let me tell you something about hiding it myself. I, I told you I did that for a decade. It doesn't work. Fig leaves won't do. So ready? Listen to me. God killed an innocent animal, covered them with tunics and kicked them out of the garden. And ready, the only way back into the garden, remember God set up a cherubim, a sword, to the, and no one could ever get back there. But the Bible also says that Jesus took the sword. He got back. He got us back. He got us back to the tree of life. And I don't want to go into too much detail. I have notes, and I'm not, I'm not even going to read them all. I just want to say this to you. That when Jesus cursed the fig tree, he was cursing the works of humanity to try to cover their own shame and nakedness. It's not by works lest any man should boast. Sowing is working. I was afraid and I hid myself. Let me tell you something. Let me just say this. That the blood of Jesus Christ, first of all, Jesus wasn't just a man. God was in him, reconciling the world to himself. Jesus was fully God and fully man. He wasn't half man and half God. I don't know how all that works. I don't understand the fullness of what Father, Son, and Holy Ghost is, but I do know one thing. Jesus was fully God and fully man. And, and let me tell you something. You might need water baptism. You know, a lot of people explain it away. And I'm not, I, look, look, if you need water baptism, talk to your elder. I know you're, you're saved by faith and not by water. Only believers get in the water, correct? However, it's more than just a symbol. You know why? It's a command. Jesus commanded it. If Jesus commanded it, what are you playing games trying to explain it away for? He commanded it. And he also said you will receive the Holy Spirit. So, hey, all I know to, to let you know is that when Jesus cursed the fig tree and they came back and saw it, he said, have faith in God. For surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea and does not what? Does not doubt in his heart, but believes those things he says will be done. He will have whatever he says. Therefore I say unto you, what things so, when you ask, when you pray, believe you receive them and you will have them. This is faith, folks. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, uh-oh, wait a minute. Uh-uh. You don't understand what that man did to me. I hear that a lot from people. You don't understand what my ex did. My ex did. You don't understand. No, Jesus said anything against anyone. Wait a minute. Come on. Did he really? Yeah. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him that your Father in heaven may also forgive your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. So, Basically, I'm done, but I'm here to tell you, what are you, I'm, I'm going to ask you, what are you sowing? What are you trying to cover up? Even as Christians, what are you sowing? What are you, what are you messing around with that God doesn't like? What do you need to repent of? Who do you need to forgive? Stop sowing. Stop sowing. Let me tell you something. It's freedom. Jesus came to set us free. And he loves us so much. Do you know that? Do you know? And faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Wait a minute. Not seen? That reminds me of a doctor. A nurse comes into the doctor's office and says, Doctor, doctor, there's a man in the waiting room, and he thinks he's the invisible man. What should I tell him? The doctor said, Tell him I can't see him today. <laughs> Faith is invisible. Now faith, we, the Bible says in Hebrews, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. By what? By faith we understand. Not by understanding. So let me close. 
Every eye closed, every head bowed. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, first of all, I want to thank you that fig leaves didn't do, that fig leaves wouldn't do. I want to thank you. God, I want to thank you. Before you kicked Adam and Eve out of the garden, you killed innocent animals pointing to a bloody cross. I want to thank you for delivering me from demons and drugs and depression and razor blades and a halfway house. Forty years, Lord. Is there anyone here at all that needs to find Jesus? If, if you do, just put your hand up right now. If you need Jesus, put your hand up. If you need to come to Jesus for the first time, put your hand up. Now, if there's any of you here that need to be water baptized, I would submit to you to come and talk to one of the elders, okay? Soon. If there's anybody who needs the power of the Holy Spirit, come forward. There's elders here right now. They will pray for you to receive power. We're not talking about just a prayer. We're talking about real power to witness. Amen? Amen. Now, if there's somebody else here right now and you're struggling with anything, I don't care if it's fear, it could be COVID, it could be anything at all, our God and our King is able to deliver. And the elders are up here to pray. If anyone is sick, let them call for the elders of the church and they shall pray the prayer of faith. So feel free to come up for any reason. I just want to open that up to you. If you need the Holy Spirit, if you need water, if you need to come and talk to an elder, if you need, if you need a healing, if you need deliverance, come forward. Don't wait. This is the time. Don't wait. Come forward. Praise God. And let me say to you, this is being videotaped. I'm, pray, I'm, I'm looking at you right now. You're sitting there at home watching this on your computer or your phone. I'm saying to you right now, fig leaves won't do. You've been sowing. You've been depressed. You've been down. You're even contemplating suicide yourself. Let me tell you something right now. Fig leaves won't do. Come to Jesus. He will deliver you. Amen? He will deliver you. He will touch you. He will bless you. Come to GCF. It's on Facebook. Contact us or go to a church. Go to a church. Go to a coffee house and eat some cake. Hallelujah. But I just want to praise God right now and pray. Father, in Jesus' name. I thank you for 40 years of walking with you. Thank you for 40 years of the power of your name, the power of your spirit. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you've enjoyed this. To hear other messages, go to facebook.com forward slash GCF Church or youtube.com forward slash GCF Messages. You may also follow Georgetown Christian Fellowship with our app. Go to either iOS or the Play Store for Android and search for Word Server. That's one word, Word Server and install the free application. There you will get all of our messages, including streaming capabilities.